I'd like to jump right in with an introduction to the FIRE standard. That's FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Uh, just to start, a few words about myself. My name is Josh Mandel. I am a physician and a software engineer, and I've been the chief architect for the Smart Health IT project, which we'll be talking about in the next module, uh, as well as a core contributor to the FIRE specification. And my day job is at Microsoft Healthcare. Uh, this presentation is going to include slides that have been adapted from a broad set of community work that is all available and openly licensed on the FIRE GitHub site. Uh, and these slides are most closely adapted uh, by a slide set from Rick Smithies. So please follow those links and, and you'll be able to test to get access to these same slides. Over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, uh, I want to share with you some of the background and context about FIRE give you a sense of what these standards are designed to do, but more than anything else, how they work and, and how you can learn more about them, give you a sense of some of the uh, underlying principles behind these standards uh, and give you a sense of where they're used. So let's jump right in uh, with a little bit of context and historical background. Um, I wanna start with a few of the older standards, the things that came before the FIRE standard and are still widely used in healthcare today to give you a sense of which problems are solved by each standard um, and, and some sense of why things have evolved in the direction that they have. Uh, so we start with what's called HL7 version two. So HL7 or Health Level 7 is an international standards development organization, brings together uh, countries, private organizations, public organizations, uh, academics, industry from around the world uh, to define healthcare standards. And, and version two is one of the earlier standards that came out in the 1980s, uh, which is really designed to help with what's called a messaging system to allow one piece of software inside of a hospital network to send out messages to other pieces of software inside the same network when certain events happen. Maybe a new patient got admitted to the emergency room, or maybe a new lab test was ordered or a new lab result arrived. Every one of these different things that could happen in the space of the healthcare ecosystem uh, would generate in HL7 version two what's called a message. Uh, and the nice thing was this worked really well inside of an institution where all the software could be configured just right to understand the same set of messages uh, and work well together. Uh, but there was a really deep learning curve or a steep learning curve to working with these technologies. Uh, in particular, it, it was developed in a day where just the basics for how to write a message and send it over the wire needed to be defined in a sort of healthcare specific standard. Uh, so we had a whole pretty deep stack uh, that healthcare developers needed to learn before they could even get started. Uh, but more challenging were some of the architectural limitations of this messaging based uh, healthcare interoperability. It was very difficult to scale these kinds of interactions across the boundaries of different organizations because every message was a little bit different, was configured differently by the piece of software that generated it. And so to have a conversation between two pieces of software, first you'd have a conversation between two human beings so they could agree and understand about exactly how everything was configured. Uh, it's also worth saying that, that back in the days when the HL7 V2 standard was developed, uh, there really wasn't much security or privacy infrastructure to build on. Um, but HL7 version two is still widely deployed um, in the healthcare ecosystem today. And one of the challenges from V2 though, was this degree of customization that you needed to actually deploy it somewhere. Um, and so fast forward 10 to 20 years, there was a focus on providing some better abstractions so that rather than a new message for every different event that could happen, there would be a consistent set of patterns, uh, one set of patterns, a reference information model that could be used to talk about all kinds of different things that happen in the healthcare system, um, all with one set of vocabulary. And this was what's known as HL7 um, version three. Uh, and there were a number of challenges with version three. It, did, it didn't ever see wide adoption uh, within the United States at least, uh, because the specification itself was very difficult to learn. It was written um, in terms of these abstractions. So rather than saying things like uh, the clinician prescribed a medication to the patient, in version three, you would talk about the world in terms of participations and acts and entities, these very abstract concepts. Uh, and developers who were trying to get started using HL7 version three often got stuck or got involved in very expensive and complicated projects. Um, one offshoot of HL7 version three, which in the United States and, and also worldwide has seen a lot more uptake has been the clinical document architecture. Um, so this is a way of sharing information about a particular unit of care, maybe a single hospitalization, or maybe a, a summary record that talks about somebody's historical uh, medical history. Uh, and the nice thing about this document oriented paradigm is that you could wrap up everything you want to say about that episode of care, about that hospitalization, for example, in a single document, 
uh, and there would be a section where the medications would go and a section where the problems would go uh, and so on. Now that technology that was used under the hood for writing all this stuff down in CDA uh, was all based on V3 and it still did have a very steep learning curve. Uh, and many different vendors who implemented support for CDA wound up making slightly different implementation choices. It became pretty difficult to extract details out of these documents in a consistent way. So that when developers wanted to work with data in these CDA documents, they might have to have a number of, of special cases for working with documents that were produced uh, by each vendor. But still, this has been uh, an important means of moving data around the healthcare ecosystem in the United States. And it's something that every EHR product in the US today supports natively or out of the box is the ability to generate these CDA documents. But if you think about all these standards uh, that we've talked about, um, an interesting thing to do is to plot them out in terms of how difficult is it to actually work with the standard and how much rich stuff can you say with the standard? And so on the simplest end of the spectrum, you've got something like, I'm going to send you a free text document. It's very easy to create, very easy to receive a free text document if all you want to do is store it or display it. But there's not a lot of semantic depth, which is to say, when you get one of these documents, all you really know, all you can really automatically pull out of that is the fact that here's a character string. Um, it's very difficult if I just give you a free text document to answer questions like which medications were prescribed or did the dosing go up over time? You really need a human or some advanced natural language processing in the loop to be able to do those kinds of things. Um, so if we think about the standards that we've looked at, uh, there's been this sort of upward trajectory that they've gotten more difficult to work with over time as that semantic depth has grown. Um, and one of the goals has been to see if we could actually bend this curve with a new standard. And, and, and we think this is really where FIRE shines is that it has a pretty reasonable degree of semantic depth compared to some of the earlier standards, but it's designed to be something that developers can pick up more quickly so that the difficulty isn't continuing to climb in this way. And obviously this is a matter of taste. So these points are plotted here in a two-dimensional space as though all these things were quantitative, but in fact, um, these are subjective assessments, um, but still it's a useful framework to think about when you're evaluating a standard. So with that set up, with, with that sort of historical perspective and some understanding of these trade-offs, um, I want to give you a sense of how this came about. This is going back to 2011, um, as HL7 was struggling with some of these challenges of increasing complexity in the standards, they undertook a fresh look task force. Um, and I, I remember attending one of the first meetings here where we were talking about uh, the challenges that developers were facing uh, and looking at the same time at some of the places where web APIs were being quite successful. So companies like Twitter, or Facebook, uh, were putting out services and documenting them with a standard, uh, not, not a standardized, but a very consistent set of patterns for working with their data, writing them down in consistent ways uh, and allowing client applications to interact with those data following um, a similar set of patterns. And we began to ask, what would it look like to do this in the healthcare ecosystem? Um, so Fire was, was really, asking the question, what would happen if we applied these same kinds of consumer web API principles to healthcare? So the single slide introduction to FHIR, uh, to wrap it all in one place, is to say this is importantly a free and open standard. So this is something that developers can work with without having to pay a license fee um, or, or agree to any terms that limit what they can do with the standard. And it's designed to capture a lot of the simplicity that we saw from HL7 version 2, where developers could get started very quickly but following a conventional set of modern web standards using technologies like JSON and HTTP and REST APIs. And we'll talk a little bit about these technologies as we go further in the presentation. But the idea with FHIR is it should be really easy to implement simple use cases, to implement the basics of working with healthcare data, and that over time, uh, as you want to be able to work with more complex data or enter into more interesting workflows, uh, you'd be able to slowly or incrementally adopt additional features or support for additional resources. So the goal with FHIR was really making something that was going to be easy to, to generate rapid uptake. Um, and there's finally, in terms of where we are today, we're about uh, eight years into the history of the FHIR specification, but it's really just reaching a stage of maturity over the last year or so, um, where it's ready for wide production deployment. Um, and so thinking about where we are in the history of standards overall, FHIR is still a relative recent comer, um, and there's still quite a long tail of technologies that are in broad deployment in the healthcare ecosystem. So even as FHIR's popularity grows, many of the technologies that came before it uh, will continue to be widely used in the healthcare space as well. And one of the important things about FHIR has been the cadence of the release cycle in, of the standard itself. 
So there's a great community, and we'll talk more about the community of participants in the fire specification uh, design all around the world. And the goal is roughly every 18 months, let's say uh, 18 to 24 months, we release a new version of the fire specification. Uh, so where we stand right now, we are somewhere between what's called R4, or the fourth revision of the fire spec, and R5, the fifth revision. And R4 is particularly interesting because it's the first version of the fire standard uh, that is what we call a normative specification in some areas, which means that we're actually locking things in and promising that we're not going to make breaking changes to these particular areas of the specification. Uh, but at the same time, we recognize that not the entire spec is equally mature. So the parts that are quite mature and locked down and parts that are still developing and uh, likely to change over time. To give you a sense of this kind of worldwide community, uh, it's worth saying that over a thousand organizations have participated in uh, fire testing and development at a set of events called a Connectathon, which happens at least three times a year around some of the community working group meetings. Uh, and it can be difficult to get a broad sense of everything that's happening in this space as the community has grown. Uh, but one of the best resources to tap into this community is the fire chat site. So this is chat.fire.org. Um, and it's a place where you can go to hook into and ask questions about and answer questions about what's happening uh, in a number of different topic areas. Uh, almost any use case you can think of, there's probably a community on the chat.fire.org site who's beginning to delve deep um, into that use cases. Uh, another way to do this is to get a sense of who's using some of the testing servers. So this is a view of one of the fire testing servers uh, that's hosted by the, the Happy Project. Uh, and this shows you sort of a global map that gives you a sense that there's people on nearly every continent working with fire today. Um, but there's a very strong concentration uh, among those populations in the US, uh, in Western Europe, um, in India, uh, and uh, in, in Asia. Uh, it's also worth saying, of course, there's very strong community participation in Australia and New Zealand, some of the core developers of the fire specification. Uh, Graham Greve, the principal architect of the fire specification, uh, is based in Melbourne, Australia. It's always been a strong focus of fire adoption. So in terms of the goals of fire, more important than anything else is this emphasis or focus on what we call the implementer. So this is an individual developer, uh, engineer, analyst, who's, who's going to be working with FHIR, working with the specification day to day and putting it into practice. And these are the people who are going to be reading the specification and using it. And it seems trivial to say, uh, but we really in the FHIR specification try to make it easy to read and easy to use for that community. Um, and one of the challenges in standards is to figure out where do you draw the line? How much do you standardize? And where do you say, well, that just goes beyond what we can really get agreement on? And in FHIR, there's a principle, which is called the 80% principle. We'll talk about it in more detail, uh, but it's an important way to prevent us from trying to boil the ocean in standards development. It allows us to draw some lines in a very pragmatic way. Uh, and then an important goal of FHIR is to invent as little new stuff as possible. So let's lean into existing web technologies and use those everywhere that they help. Anytime we're sending information from one place to another, we would like that information to be human readable as well as machine readable. Um, and the goal is for the FHIR specifications to be usable in a variety of contexts. And then really critically, FHIR uh, has a goal of being an open standard in the sense that anyone can take it and implement it in an openly licensed way. And it also comes with support tools that have been developed uh, as open source tools. So when we say that FHIR has uh, an implementer focus, uh, the goal here is that it's designed to be a readable specification that's broken down into building blocks that somebody can pick up and learn independently and to provide a set of tools that help you get started from the very beginning, working with FHIR uh, in a programming language of your choice. Um, another key principle here is to provide lots of examples so that when you're reading the specification, you're not just trying to interpret paragraphs of text, but you can look at examples of what these FHIR data models or resources look like over the wire and get started working with them that way. So when we talk about FHIR supporting the 80%, what we really mean here is that we, first of all, try to focus on use cases that are important to the community. Uh, but within any given use case, it might be something obscure or it might be something common within any use case. Uh, we try to model the things that are going to be widely supported um, by the systems implementing uh, that use case. So let's look at an example uh, of a patient record. Any system that's working with a patient record needs to capture some aspects of who that patient is, their demographics, for example. Uh, and so if we're going to try to decide whether to include a particular element or not, we'll look at how commonly supported that element is in real world systems. So for something like patient uh, birth date, 
that's something that almost any real world system that works with patient records is going to know how to understand. Um, so patient birth date is included in the core specification. It's included in those models. But you could imagine lots of things that could be stored on a patient record. Uh, so for example, some healthcare systems are developed in the context of, uh, of a military healthcare system. And so something you might store on every given patient record is uh, military service history. Most systems, however, don't have that kind of military service history as a core concept. And since we haven't gotten up to the mark where 80% of those systems would support military service history as a property on a patient, uh, we don't include it in the core FHIR model. We'll come back and, and explain how that doesn't limit you. Uh, we'll come back and explain how FHIR has an extensibility system so that even if a particular data element isn't included in what we call the 80%, it can still be modeled and it can still be communicated or shared between systems using FHIR. Now, I also mentioned that FHIR is designed to be based on web technologies. And in particular, we're talking about uh, using HTTP. So when a client wants to connect to a server, there's a standardized way to do that with web standards. Uh, and there's a few different serialization formats, a few different ways that information can come back over the wire when a client connects to a server. But one of the ones that the community has been the most focused on has been JSON, the JavaScript object notation. But we'll look at examples over the course of this presentation in XML as well as in JSON. Um, and then FHIR is designed to provide what's called a REST API. And we'll talk about the details of this, but it's a common set of interaction patterns where a client can connect to a server and issue queries. Um, when it comes to security, again, we rely on web standards. So uh, transport level security, TLS, um, is deployed almost anywhere that a FHIR system is put in production in the real world. Uh, and we have standardized ways to use protocols like OAuth, which we'll talk about when we dig into the Smart on FHIR APIs uh, in the next module. One of the principles in FHIR is that anytime we're sending a resource over the wire, it should have a human readable expression. So it might include arrays and, and all kinds of data and, and computable information, but it's useful if a human can also get a quick view of what's going on uh, in that resource. And it's also worth saying that even though in this presentation, we're gonna give a deeper overview of the, the RESTful API, a way that a client can interact with a server uh, using HTTP, that overall FHIR is designed to make as few architectural assumptions as possible. It's designed to be architecturally agnostic so that FHIR can be used uh, with moving files around um, on a network. FHIR can be used in, in various paradigms, even outside of REST. Uh, and of course, we mentioned that FHIR is designed as an open standard. Uh, the core specification is licensed under the Creative Commons Zero license, which makes it effectively a public domain specification. You can take it and work with it as you will. All right, so let's dig into the meat of the FHIR specification itself and talk about resources. Uh, so in FHIR, resources are the data model or the content model that explains how to share information in healthcare. It's really, what is it that we're exchanging from one place to another? That's a FHIR resource. It's the unit of exchange. And the models that, get, that went into FHIR have been deeply informed by prior work in the standards community. So FHIR resource might represent uh, a clinical perspective, from a clinical perspective, uh, the content um, of a clinical or administrative function. So maybe something like a problem that's been diagnosed or an observation that's been made uh, in the lab. From a FHIR implementer perspective, uh, there's also a few additional properties, some metadata that we'll talk about that makes it easy to move these resources around uh, and save them and search through them in the future. And FHIR keeps a list of resources as part of the specification. And today there's um, between 100 and 150 resources in the FHIR specification at various stages of maturity. So next to each resource in the list on the slide here, you'll see a number which represents the maturity score, which goes from zero, which is the least mature, uh, to five or to normative, which is the most mature. So what is a good candidate for defining as a FHIR resource? Um, first thing that we can do is talk about a couple of examples. So in the administrative domain, uh, we, we have resources for things like a patient or a healthcare practitioner or an encounter or an organization. Um, in the clinical domain, we have resources for things like a, a clinical condition or uh, a medication prescription um, or for a laboratory uh, or general observation. There's also some infrastructure resources, which we might talk about a bit later, uh, that are useful when we're trying to share information at a system level. Um, it's also useful to think about some counter examples. So we don't have a resource for something like gender because it's too small. It's not what we would consider to be a unit at exchange. 
Uh, gender is information we might communicate about a patient, but I wouldn't just send you a gender and say, here you go, I just sent you the gender male. Um, it's only Gender is something that's only useful in the context of a record. Similarly, something like blood pressure um, is too specific. So we could define a different fire resource for every different lab test and every different observation that can be made, but then we would have an endless number of resources to define. And we try to use these resources as common patterns or building blocks. Um, similarly, we, we wouldn't define a resource or something as broad as a complete electronic health record. Uh, we try to make reusable building blocks uh, so that they can be assembled for different use cases as needed. The really powerful thing about resources, though, is not just that I can send you one resource um, over the wire and communicate to you uh, information about uh, a given patient or a given lab test. The powerful thing is that resources can link together to form a graph. Uh, and we'll look at some examples here. So let's say I do a, a, a medical procedure. That's a, represented in a fire resource. And I want to say that this procedure was performed on a specific patient. Well, rather than capturing all the details about that patient inside of my procedure resource, instead I create a link or fire creates a link between these resources so that now anytime I wanna to refer to a patient, I can simply point to that patient and I don't have to copy details about the patient uh, into every procedure that was done for the patient. So similarly, when I'm thinking about tracking a procedure, I wanna know who did the procedure, who was the performer of that procedure. And typically that would be a healthcare practitioner, a clinician. So we've got a resource in FHIR for the practitioner, but rather than including information about that specific person, uh, what their name is, what their medical license number is in every procedure that I perform, instead, I just provide a link or a pointer or a reference from my procedure to my practitioner. And FHIR relies very heavily on these kinds of references to allow us to reuse resources without having to embed them inside others. And this is really critically important uh, for FHIR's semantic capabilities for, for being able to move information around. So we'll do a quick tour of a FHIR resource uh, and look through the different parts that make up a resource so you can get a sense of what's going on uh, over the wire. Uh, and we'll use one of the examples from the FHIR summary documentation to do it, which is an example of a patient resource. And so at the top here, you can see there's some basic metadata, information about the ID of this resource. And right below that is a human readable narrative text. So this is rendered as XHTML, uh, which is a pre-rendered view of this person's name and medical record number. Um, below that, there's an example of what we call extensions, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. But extensions are ways to put additional information about a resource that might not be included uh, in the core data models in FHIR. And then finally, we get into the standardized data. So in this case, it might be something like the patient's name and address and medical record numbers that are stored down here. Um, we're looking at an XML representation of a patient here, but we'll also look at some representations using the JavaScript object notation. And there's a, a larger version of that same uh, information here. It makes it a little bit easier to read. Now, inside of a resource, we need to say lots of things, uh, for example, about a patient. And for this, we use data types. Uh, and in FHIR, we have a set of primitive data types, which allow us to convey things like uh, numbers and dates and times and Boolean values, true or false. Uh, but we also in FHIR define a set of complex data types, which are reusable units that convey information like a person's street address or a human name. Uh, because as we all know, a human name is not as simple as just a string of text. Somebody might have a given name, might have a number of different family names, um, names that are used in different contexts. And so these FHIR uh, provides a set of complex um, data types, which are reused quite often. And one that I'll point out, because we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail, uh, is the codable concept resource. We'll get there in a little bit. Um, so each resource in FHIR defines a set of elements, which might be uh, described using these data types, whether they're primitive or whether they're complex. And sometimes an element might need to take different shapes. It might be a polymorphic element. So for example, for a, the patient resource in FHIR, we need to say whether a patient is deceased or not. Um, but sometimes we want to say more than just whether or not they're deceased. Sometimes we want to say something about uh, when they died. And so in FHIR, we have a, a data element that can be used to do this, which is written here as deceased X. Uh, and X indicates there's two different data types that can be used. One is a Boolean, if I just want to convey yes or no. And the other is a date time, which I used if I want to convey uh, the information about when they died. It's important that I wouldn't want to force somebody to say both of those at the same time. If I know when a person died, I know that they have died. And so there's no value in uh, providing those two pieces of information separately. And that's why in FHIR, those two are modeled as one polymorphic data element. 
Now, I mentioned that in FIRE, we focus on the 80%, which is to say the things where we have broad agreement uh, about what should go into the data model. But the truth is that many use cases in FIRE and many individual health data systems have their own specific requirements. And FIRE would fall flat on its feet if it did not allow support for those specific requirements. So what we do in FIRE is we have a built-in mechanism of what's called extensions. So anytime I'm sharing information from one place to another, I can include any of the standard data, data elements, but I can also include as many extensions as I want. And the important thing is that each extension uh, can include a value, which is the actual data, uh, as well as a URL, which tells the receiving system what this extension means. It's a reference or a pointer to a computable definition. So for example, let's say I want to convey information about um, whether somebody served in the military as part of a patient resource. Uh, that's not one of the core data elements, but I can include an extension uh, that had a, a value which might be, let's say, a Boolean, yes or no. And that could be sent from uh, any, any system. And a receiving system might not know how to interpret that extension, but it would know how to process it in a standard way, and it would know where to go to look for more information. And so if you're displaying this resource to a human being, for example, you could follow this uh, URL to get information about what the extension means, and you could show that definition back to the human being. So even though the data element wasn't in the core definition of the FHIR standard, you can still include it anytime you're sharing data. So here's an example uh, of an extension for what's called uh, birth order. So in a patient where I'm saying they were part of a, a multiple birth, maybe like a set of twins or triplets, uh, FHIR allows you to say simply that they were part of a multiple birth, uh, but it doesn't let you say which order. But you could provide an extension to say, uh, in this case, this person was the, the second uh, to be born in this multiple birth. birth. It's not part of the 80%. Most systems that know about multiple births don't know about birth order. So that's why it's not included in the core of the FHIR spec. But a system that needs this kind of information and can provide it using an extension. Uh, another important place where we use extensions is to meet national requirements. So for example, in the US, we have a requirement that we need to be able to exchange information about the race and ethnicity uh, of a patient anytime we're talking about that patient. Other, syst uh, other nationalities, other different uh, countries don't have a requirement for that. And in, in fact, in some countries it's prohibited. So this doesn't reach the level of the 80%, uh, but it's still important in the US. So we define a set of national extensions called the US core extensions, where we can tack on additional information to the patient record. In this case, information about a patient's race and about their ethnicity. Now in FHIR, uh, every resource has what's called an ID. And if the resource is hosted on the web, it might live at a specific server somewhere. So in this example, it's server.org. Um, and then through a set of paths, these are these different components separated by slashes, uh, you'll have information about the resource type. So in this case, it's a patient. And then finally, the resource ID. And this is a full pointer to this specific patient 1234 resource. That pointer might be shared anywhere in the world. And a system that receives a pointer or a reference like this would be able to follow that reference and learn more about who that patient was. Uh, inside each resource, that ID is conveyed as a property. So in XML, it's included uh, in this patient element here with a value of 1234. And so this, the fact that you see ID 1234 in this line here corresponds to this final path segment of the URL, 1234 over here. I want to talk a little bit about terminologies in FHIR uh, because in every healthcare standard that we work with, Coded data is incredibly important. I don't just want to convey walls of text from one place to another. I don't just want to convey a list of codes that we use inside of my hospital. Maybe I want to convey information using a set of standardized codes that anyone's going to be able to understand. And in FHIR, there's a few different aspects to the way that we work with uh, terminologies. Some terminologies are built into the FHIR specification itself. So for example, there's a very simple and in many ways controversial coding for gender built into the FHIR specification itself that just has a, a few values in it. So that in that case, the core FHIR specification directly publishes these, uh, these coded uh, data values and a client who wants to work with those simply uses strings over the wire. But in many cases in FHIR, we know that there's a piece of information that should be coded, but it won't always be coded. And for that, we have a data type called a codable concept. It might just be represented as text, but it may also be represented using a set of uh, codes, for example, from a standard vocabulary uh, like LOINC for observations. So an example here would be the LOINC code for a blood glucose measurement. Now, codable concepts are very widely used in FHIR. Um, 
And the other interesting thing to say about them is that they can include more than one coded value. Um, so if I happen to know uh, what the right term for a blood glucose is in LOINC, but also in my custom local lab code and also in a standard like SNOMED, I can include all three of those in a single codable concept, basically include them as translations uh, in my payload. And so let's just look at the codable concept payload here, where we might have a list of codings. Um, in this case, what we have is a SNOMED CT code for an anaphylaxis, uh, anaphylactic reaction. So we've got a computable system here, which is expressed as the URL for SNOMED CT. We've got this specific code, which in this case is an eight-digit SNOMED numerical code. And then we've got the SNOMED display name for this, which is anaphylactic reaction. And in addition to that standardized coding, we also have a text value, which just says anaphylaxis. So that's an example of what a fire codable concept looks like over the wire. Uh, and there's many more examples of these kinds of codable concepts in the fire specification. The last thing that I want to talk about then is working with fire as a REST API. And REST stands for representational state transfer. It's a set of patterns for working with uh, data over the web. And it represents data as effectively resources that live at specific URLs. It makes those resources addressable at those URLs using HTTP methods. We'll show some examples of what that looks like. Uh, so we mentioned already that a specific patient 1234 might be accessible at this URL. Uh, and let's dig into some of the things that we can do sort of beyond just fetching that patient at the URL. Uh, so one thing is you can provide additional parameters uh, in the form of these URL parameters. So this is a standard way of uh, adding parameters to our URL is using this question mark syntax. So I might ask for a resource in a specific format, like JSON or like XML. I can do that using a query parameter like this, or I could also do that using an HTTP header. Uh, I can also do a search. So rather than fetching patient 1234, here I can say, I want to find all patients whose name is Smith using this query parameter. Um, and Fire defines a set of standardized query parameters for each resource. Uh, so REST allows you to do resource searches across specific resource types using a standardized set of parameters. So a patient you can search for by name or by birth date or by gender and a number of uh, parameters that have been specified. Um, another way that you can search for a patient is by a medical record number. So let's say you know that a specific patient's medical record number consists of all nines. Uh, so you can search for all patients who have a medical record number that looks like that. And you'll get back uh, a set of resources that match your search. So in practice, each resource uh, exists on a specific server with a stable URI, uh, so that URI will be consistent over time. Um, and you can request access to that resource. You can ask for a copy of that resource in a number of different formats. Uh, Fire defines out-of-the-box formats for XML and JSON and the RDF, the resource description framework. And you can exchange these resources using HTTP. Um, often when we talk about REST APIs, we talk about CRUD, Create, Read, Update, and Delete. And these are four different ways that you can interact with a specific resource. So create is a way to make a new resource on a server that didn't exist before. Uh, update is a way to make changes to a resource on a server that already exists. Read is a way to fetch information uh, in a particular resource from a server. And delete is a way to remove that resource from a server. Uh, although I did leave out the important S for search. Uh, so often we'll talk about CRUD S, CRUDs. Uh, and we've already looked at a couple of examples of search interactions in Fire. Now in Fire, you can do some of these operations at the level of a specific resource, like I can read information about patient 100 or update the record for patient 100. Some of the interactions happen at the level of uh, the type. So for example, if I'm going to create a new patient, I don't do that on patient 100. I do that at the level of the general patient resource, and the server will be responsible for um, assigning a new ID to the new patient that I'm creating. Similarly, search happens at the type level. So I don't search within patient 100, but I might search for all patients with a specific name uh, or with a specific ID. And then Fire defines a couple of operations at the level of the, the system. Um, the most important one of which is every Fire server hosts what's called a metadata endpoint that allows a client to learn what version of Fire that supports uh, and what specific resource types uh, exist in that server. We'll say just a couple of examples uh, for search. Uh, which is that Fire defines these uh, specific named parameters. Uh, each one is uh, defined in the Fire specification. So a few examples here are, are that I might search by a patient or search for patients by name. I might search for lab observations by a specific code. In this case, maybe a LOINC code. 
Um, those are a couple of things that you can do. There's also rich support for date-based queries. So I can search uh, for things that happened on a particular day or before or after a particular date. Um, so those are a few examples of things that we can search for in the Fire API. Uh, and there's a, a table published in the Fire spec that lists all of these out of the box. Fire also defines support for what's called versioning. Uh, so this is a way to fetch historical changes to a resource over time. So when updates happen to a specific resource, Fire defines an API to see what did that resource look like at a particular point in, the, in history. And you can, in, in servers that support it, you can look for information about that specific resource um, at any point in the course of its history. And this is very powerful when you're working with systems where data change over time and you want to get a, a view of information as it would have looked in the past. The last thing that I want to talk about in the overview of Fire is profiling. And so the core Fire specification defines a set of resources, uh, but it doesn't make a lot of constraints on them. So most of the resources in the Fire spec out of the box define a set of data elements, but doesn't make uh, any of them required. So for example, when I look at the patient resource in Fire, there's a data element called name and a data element called address, but neither one of them is required. I could send you a patient with no name and, and no address. Similarly, when I look at a lab observation in Fire, uh, there's a codable concept that tells you what was observed, but I don't. The, the core Fire specification doesn't require any particular coding to be used. Uh, but sometimes, when systems want to exchange data for a particular purpose, it's very important to lock these details down, so that clients know what to expect and servers can be clear what they ought to be generating. And this is where profiling comes in. Rather than building those requirements into the core of the Fire specification, Fire allows for specific communities to get together and publish their own profiles in the form of an implementation guide to lock down those kinds of details. So you can say things like, in the context of working with uh, Fire data for a US core data exchange, we're always going to include LOINC codes on our lab tests, or we're always gonna include a name in our patient resources. And that's what Fire profiling is for. It allows people to make those kinds of constraints and to define additional extensions that must be used uh, in specific contexts. Now, it's possible to use Fire with no profiles at all, just using the base specification. Um, and in some contexts, that's a, a totally appropriate thing to do. But profiles are very helpful, particularly for things like national programs or specific use cases where you want to lock down uh, those details. So that's where I want to stop for the introduction to Fire. Uh, and we'll follow up just after this with an introduction to the Smart on Fire app platform.